Hi everyone. Um, I'm trying to vary the uh, screenshot that you get right at the beginning, um, so it looks a bit more, a bit different each time I do a, do a presentation. So, um, but I thought today what I talk about is one of the most common questions that, that I get from particularly new injectors is how to handle a hematoma. And I had a really good one recently from a very intelligent uh, injector who was asking us very intelligent questions. And the thing that I like most of all is that there was a reflection at the end of this about what could be done better next time. And for me, that's a crucial part of mastering aesthetics is that you continuously ask that question of, of okay, this bad thing happened, which I wish didn't happen. What can I do to, to chip away at that risk and have it happen even less often? even if you did nothing wrong. So a really important thing, even if you did nothing wrong, what can you do to get better is a great question. So let's have a think about um, managing and avoiding hematomas in lips. Um, first of all, it starts with diagnosis. So we've got to, you've got to get the diagnosis right. And this is normally why I get messages is because people are freaking out because they don't know if it's, a, if it's an occlusion or if it's a hematoma. So how do we make sure that it's not an occlusion? Uh, by far the most important thing is capillary refill. Like we all, you look at it, basically what happens I think is we, you know, you, you haven't been injecting for a long time. You look at, you suddenly get someone, sometimes you have been injecting for a long time. Sometimes people get through quite a long time with injecting before they get really big hematoma and it freaks them out. And they, they think this is, this, this looks so different from what I've seen before that it must be something bad and they start to panic. And because we are lucky to be in a, in a an industry where actually it's very rare to get these serious complications. Most of us don't diagnose them on a daily basis. So when it looks really different to what we used to, sometimes you, you freak out and you start to think, is this a really bad thing? So we need to, first of all, as in all things basically medically related, you rule out the serious thing before you start to worry about the benign thing that it probably is. So the, the first and most important step of this is capillary refill. So you can also then reflect on what happened during the procedure. But usually this is someone who calls you the next day and says, this is really sore. So they're not in front of you anymore. Now there are things you can do in your procedure that would make this better. So I always recommend checking capillary refill at the end of any procedure that you've injected. And in fact, the one we did last week with Dr. Ahmed, he, he noticed it and, and he diagnosed it there and then, which is the best place you can possibly diagnose it. All of those people tend to end up, uh, in our experience, um, the problem is dissolved. Uh, before they leave the clinic. So that's what you want. But if it happens later on and you get this big bruise um, or there's basically a panicking client who sends you a WhatsApp picture is the most common thing I get saying, what is this? I'm really worried. And they're no longer in front of you. They might be 50 miles away somewhere. So the first thing is always to rule out an occlusion. And the best way to do that is with capillary refill. I actually think it's, it's not ideal to do this with video, but it's certainly better than nothing um, because it helps you gauge you can often be 100% certain, you feel, I think it feels almost 100% certain looking at a good quality video in good light with someone who compresses the entire arterial tree around that area and then releases and you see blood flow equally into both sides of the lip, it's really important. And though it's not the most dignified thing, I'm gonna show you how to do it now because uh, it's really important to do this properly. If you touch a lip really lightly and push and release, even I, I've, I think I've seen occluded lips that have some capillary refill and it's basically because I don't think a light touch is squeezing blood out of the, the whole um, part of the lip. It's basically just the surface of the lip and there's enough that will enough blood in the body of the lip that you might get some capillary refill even though blood flow isn't great. So we want a really hard push. So I want, And the other thing is you want to compare it to the, the other side of the lip simultaneously. So I think it's more sensitive to push um, with a gloved hand normally, both both hands on top of your uh, on top of the lips and to push really firmly for at least five seconds. So something like this. And when you release, you should see that. I think I could see that quite well in the video, both sides equally filled with blood straight away. Um, and you can be very reassured by that. So that's the first thing you do is to try and get the diagnosis right before you start um, panicking about what it is. So do a capillary refill. That's the first thing. No one can can reassure you that it's not a, not a problem with blood flow if they haven't checked capillary refill. So um, assuming that's okay, now the big problem with hematomas is obviously that there's obviously a discoloration of the skin and you can't always see, and this is why we often need to get them back in to check. So the other parts of the story to rule the difference between a hematoma and an occlusion is gonna be around pain. 
So initially, if there's a lot of bruising, you get tenderness and it can be uncomfortable, but it should be very different to a, an occlusion where there should be increasing pain. Certainly by 12 to 24 hours after the procedure, if there's an occlusion, it's really painful. Um, if it's a hematoma, the worst of the pain should be over. They should have had pain after the procedure, a swelling. They'll have a tenderness when you squeeze the bumper and when, you, when they move around that area, but you shouldn't have incredible pain in the, in the same way as you do with an occlusion. So assuming you've done that, because that's the most important thing, we've ruled out it being a, an occlusion. The next thing that you must do is, is make a firm diagnosis of hematoma to your patient. And patients need reassurance in this moment. They, they're not medical. It's amazing. It always amazes me how much we take for granted in terms of our understanding. I have seen patients look really surprised many times when I've said, so basically a bruise is caused by the needle going through a blood vessel underneath the skin, and then the blood vessel bleeds, and the blood leaks out into the tissue, and that's what a bruise is. And they go, oh, right, is that what a bruise is? It's just not, if it's not, if you're not medically trained, these things don't always go into your head. You just think a bruise equals danger. Uh, and that's how most people react to bruises. It's, it's associated with hitting, bumping yourself or an injury. All it means is injury. They're not thinking about the path pathology going on underneath the skin. So explain that to them because that'll make them feel safer. And then from that, you can then, you can then go on to, to explain the possible things that will happen after that. So if you're gonna manage a hematoma, Basically, it's a big bruise, there's a blood clot underneath the skin, and if you do nothing, it will recover on its own. That's true uh, of most hematomas. Now, there are, there are cases, particularly with very large hematomas, where things should be done, and this is something to consider. I think less so with lips, but I suppose it could happen with lips. Um, but anywhere where you've got a really big blood clot, that's going to take a long time to heal because there's no, there's no blood supply into the middle of that. So you, if your body's working to solve the problem from the outside, and the lack of blood supply in the middle also does give you an increased risk of things like infection. So there are times when active management of the hematoma is what you should do next. Um, but for the vast majority of people, the, the management is just time. So a small hematoma, a little bump on the lip, you can wait and it will go away. I think sometimes there's something in, in actually compressing it. So if it's still quite fluid filled and um, you can compress it a little bit. And I think that's going to make the total surface area bigger. So it'll be able to be, it'll be able to be broken down by the body a little bit quicker. So a little bit of a massage, if it's quite soon afterwards, that, that kind of breaks the area down might help a little bit. I think it's unlikely to, to start bruising all over again. If it's only, if it's uh, you know, 24 hours later, I think blood clotting would have helped. That may or may not help, but it's, it's something that might increase the breakdown of it. Um, but the next thing is possible is you can actually use hyaluronidase, and this is used in, um, in fact, I've got a link I'll try and post underneath of a case where they, where they basically use it to break down the, the blood clot and then aspirate it. So in a particularly large hematoma, you might consider taking one of your green needles. Now, obviously, the, the downside is you might cause another bruise, and that's why it's no point doing this for a small hematoma, because you might just cause another hematoma. It's for those really unlucky events where you get a particularly big hematoma, um, and it's causing you know, serious distress or risk of infection or you know, there's fluctuance underneath the skin, you might be able to get it to break down much quicker if you inject some hyaluronidase into that area and then aspirate the hematoma out. Now, I would say there's not a lot of evidence for this. This is kind of an unlicensed use of, of hyaluronidase and something that some people think are, might be useful. There are papers on it, which I will, I will post a link to as well. Um, but it's, uh, you're certainly on the fringes of, you know, a lot of people will disagree with this approach. So make your own decision on it. It's, it's not for an everyday hematoma. It's for something a little bit bigger and more extreme, but it is an option. Um, so, but that is pretty much all you can do about hematomas. Uh, unless you've got something else that you've learned about that you'd like to share, I'd love to have that. So if you post on the comments, if you know some other way that you can get them to disappear quicker. Um, the other aspect, as I said, is safety netting. So once you've given them reassurance that it's basically just a, a little blood clot under the skin and it will recover on its own, give them some safety netting. It shouldn't get worse. Everything should be improving from this point on. And anything that get that starts to go down another route, so increased pain, inflammation, you could have either a reaction or an infection in the hematoma, and that would require a totally different uh, response. So remember to safety net, not just reassure and say it'll get better on its own. You can also prepare them that long after the blood clot goes, you can get something called induration. Induration is basically in response to all the, all the blood in the area. There's, there's basically a, a healing response that causes extra connective, 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 connective tissue to be laid down. 
uh, and that will um, basically cause an induration. So it's a fibrous, hard to define area of, kind of fullness or lumpiness. It's not a very discreet lump, it's kind of a general fullness. Sometimes it's a little bit tender and that's as, as a result of a prolonged healing process. And if you tell them that at this point, they're much less likely to freak out, uh, freak out about it. It will get better on its own. So induration is also self-limiting, shouldn't carry on. Um, so, um, so that's kind of your diagnosis and your safety netting. Um, what do we do about avoiding them? And this is what impressed me about the question that I had is that they really, there were, really was a, some self-reflection going on about, well, how can I get even better at not doing this? Because we had a long discussion about how the procedure was done and it was um, essentially a normal procedure that all of us would do, you know, using some injections, not, not, not some extreme technique where you're going in and out a hundred times. Um, but still, is there something you can do to reduce bruising further? And certainly that happens to the reflective injectors um, over a course of time. I don't get anywhere near as num the number of hematomas I used to get when I first started. Um, I, you know, when, when that happened, I was all often told it's normal and it is normal, but your ratio of how often it happens should, to, to how many treatments you do should drop the more experienced you get. And it's essentially about millimeter perfection in terms of the depth. So we don't go unnecessarily deep uh, we don't go unnecessarily high into the white part of the lip where the artery is. Um, we're trying to stay as far away from where we know the arteries are and do as few injections as possible to get the product in the right place. So you're entering the skin as, as, as few times as possible and um, being as gentle as possible. And we've seen videos, I've seen one of these kind of semi-viral, um, uh, one of these non-medics injecting, you'll all know him, but I don't want to get into it into a tit for tat, um, where it's just really like in and out, like very carefully, like carelessly just rogering the skin basically. And the needle's going in and out multiple, multiple times. That's a great recipe for a big hematoma. And something that if you're continuously reflecting, even if, even if someone trained you to do it that way, you're gonna gravitate away from that because every time you get a hematoma, you can think, what can I do differently? I really don't want this to happen again. And what you will come out with at the end is a, is a light touch technique where you'll be doing, hi Karen, uh, where you'll be doing little tiny, um, very accurate entry points, very as superficial as, as is safe um, without causing the filler to be visible. And you'll be doing as few injections as possible, massaging your lips gently. Um, and there are even other things you can do on top of that. So if you do get a bruise, what do you do at the point, no, not a bruise, but at the point of bleeding, what do you do when someone bleeds? Now you often see people injecting and they just wipe the area and kind of carry on and then they wipe it again and the whole time it's bleeding. I suggest you completely stop injecting if you've got a bleeder and just hold it. And the, the rule of thumb is you hold it for a, a minute if it's a gusher and 30 seconds if it's a trickler. So, you know, when you pull the needle out and it's suddenly just come, you know, this, it's trickling down, you need to stop and just hold that. And a minute doesn't sound like long, but it feels like a long time in a consultation. So it does you know, during a treatment, it feels like quite a long time to stand there doing nothing. But if you don't um, give in to the temptation to lift up and have a look underneath, you'll find that after a minute, you've got quite a high chance of lifting up and not seeing any bleeding. And that's great because that means underneath the skin, hopefully the same thing is happening, that there isn't blood perpetually leaking out into the tissue that over the next 10 minutes causes a hematoma. So we want to compress for a long time during the procedure and compress longer when your first instinct is that it's a bit of a gusher and be patient. In fact, if it's a particularly big gusher, I might not even look at it for two minutes. And during that time, tell your patient what you're doing because they'll appreciate it. They'll say, you've bled a little bit from that. So to try and reduce the bruise, what I'm gonna do is hold it for as long as possible. So um, I just realized my microphone's in the wrong place. Hope you could hear me. So, um, so hold it for a long time, that'll reduce your chance of bruising and explain to the patient as you're going along as well. Other things you can do is to use a cannula. So cannulas, Massively, it's probably at the course that is most demand from for us at the moment in at Skin Viva Training, and we do we have a series of cannula courses coming up. But a lot of people are gravitating towards cannula for this reason because although it's a little bit trickier getting in, once you've mastered it, there's far less swelling. Your patient recovers quicker. Um, you don't have all these follow-up messages and concerns with swelling and bruising and all that kind of thing. And certainly, hematomas will be way way less likely to occur if you've done the whole procedure with a cannula. So that's something else that you could consider trying uh, with lips. They're not a complete answer to every question, cannulas, because you don't always get the same definition, particularly in, in people who don't have great definition of their lips, but they certainly reduce bruising. So that's something to think about. Um, 
total number of injections as well, is there a way that you can do the same procedure without going in and out quite often? This kind of fine tuning and going in again and again, that's a risk that you can have more hematomas than the injector who manages to do small, do the whole procedure in fewer numbers of injections. So um, that's what I'd suggest. Probably the most important thing is how to avoid it. Um, so I hope that helps you guys. So if you think if you think this has been helpful, if there's anything in it that's, that you're going to reflect on and maybe change in your practice, that'd be great to hear. It matters a lot to me to see some, some that that something has happened from one of these uh, little uh, live videos I do. If, you, if you're going to try something new, if you're going to explain something differently to your patients, uh, if you're going to um, feel safer about how to diagnose and treat any of these problems because of this, really great to hear. So comments are wonderful and Likewise, if you think it's useful for someone else and you can if you could tag them in it or share this video, then I really appreciate that, that as well. Um, but I hope this has helped. Keep the questions coming in. You can ask questions on this thread, on this thread as well, and I will uh, endeavor to get through as many of them as possible. Um, so thank you very much. I hope that was helpful, guys.